Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Crash Course Economics. Uh, this is the last episode of this series on monetary policy, and we've got a full house today, so I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute, TNI, and my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who's a researcher at SOMO, and behind the scenes are Jeremy Krollsmith, Kees Hudig, and Ilona Hartley, who are working very hard to make this fourth and last webinar of this series a great success. So the five of us, we're a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations, and uh, we have united at the start of the corona crisis in order to try to understand the crisis and to work on uh, ideas and solutions. So I'll tell you a little bit about Crash Course uh, before we start. So Crash Course is a platform. It's designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps regarding the future towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. And to do that, we are inviting global experts to break down complex issues and we want to make them accessible to all so we can shape our economic system together in a just and democratic way. So our goal is to democratize knowledge and provide you with the necessary tools to change the world. And in doing so, we really want to go to the heart of the matter of complex issues and to put forward future proof and green solutions. So good to know for you is that there will be a recording of this webinar a video so it will be put online on our website later on there also will be a podcast version and a transcription or a summary textual so um in the future we might discuss different topics uh it might be feminist economics it might be global debt or the green deal we don't know yet it's going to be a surprise but first i'll give the floor to rodrigo so he can tell a little bit about the first series well uh, good afternoon it's uh, nice to see that there are so many people on a, on a Friday uh, afternoon in the Central European time. Um, so this is the fourth and last uh, webinar uh, uh, of the first series on central banking and, prog and progressive monetary policy. And uh, today, um, yeah, we, we will try to understand uh, how monetary policy uh, can be used uh, or can be part of the policy mix uh, to avoid another decade of austerity. Uh, I think that uh, everyone has seen the, the devastation that the, the, an age of austerity left. And uh, well, the COVID-19 crisis uh, led to an increase in, uh, in sovereign debt uh, in, in all parts of the world. And already we hear politicians talking on how uh, parts of uh, public spending will be slashed further. So we are very interested uh, to talk and to hear from Daniela Gabor uh, uh, how monetary policy can help uh, to avoid that. And then, since we also have so many participants today, we are opening up the floor for questions from your side, and they will be read out loud by me and Rodrigo. Um, so the way that works is that you can put your question in your special Q&A tab, you will find in the uh, lower half of your screen, and uh, we will make a selection based on those questions. If you really like a question, you can endorse it by putting the thumbs up. So in that way, uh, markedly neutral and democratically, uh, the most favored questions will pop up at first. And if you'd like, you can also introduce yourself in the chat, saying who you are and where you're from and what you're interested in. So Rodrigo, I'm very thrilled to uh, have uh, our speaker on board today. Will you please introduce her? Uh, yes, <clears throat> well, uh, so Daniela Gabor is uh, a professor of economics uh, at the University of Bristol and she works and publishes uh, on a number of topics. Um, yeah, perhaps most importantly on shadow banking, shadow money, and more specifically on uh, the political economy of, of repo or repo markets. Um, but on the other hand, she's also a very much part of uh, doing research and being part of the debate uh, with policymakers on uh, the greening of the of the monetary system uh, uh, and also um, a third lag perhaps uh, there may be other uh, other parts of, of her research is, is on the 
the Wall Street consensus uh, uh, sweeping across development uh, finance. Um, so today uh, we will be focusing more on uh, monetary financing, but uh, well, Daniela Gabor is uh, active in, on a number of topics. And so we are very, very pleased that she's here uh, to discuss these matters with us. And uh, I would like to um, invite uh, Daniela to uh, take the floor and, and uh, give a presentation. Um, and then we will come back with some questions. Great. Uh, thank you. First, thank you to the team for inviting me. And thank you to the listeners for coming into my, I would guess, my office. <laughs> uh let me see is the screen share now yes yes uh so what i uh, the team at the crash course have asked me to talk a little bit about um the ways in which monetary policy can respond to what is happening now in terms of the COVID crisis and the very rapidly rising uh, public debt to gdp ratios across the world and what kind of uh, sort of progressive solutions we might want to think of that and I thought I would frame my remarks within uh, this sort of broad concept of monetary financing. Uh, monetary financing, uh, an idea whose time I think has come again, and I'll show you in a second why. Monetary financing can take uh, different forms. Some people talk about helicopter money. This is the idea that the central bank would drop into our uh, bank deposits, uh, I don't know, a uh, 1,000 pounds, a 1,000 euros, but mostly, mon or, or it could uh, uh, sort of forgive or cancel some of the debt uh, issued by the state, but mostly monetary financing is a way of thinking about the, uh, the central bank uh, buying and holding on its balance sheet uh, debt issued by uh, the state um, um, in the form of uh, sovereign debt instruments. And uh, I want to, oh, let's see. I want to start by uh, showing you a couple of um, uh, sort of clips um, from different newspapers that discuss the death of a taboo. That is, monetary financing has been for quite a while, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a second why, it has been a taboo in the sense that uh, the idea that the central bank should in any way coordinate with the uh, government, with fiscal policy in order to reduce, for example, borrowing costs, uh, was thought of something that uh, should not come back or should not be part of a, of a macroeconomic policy regime. And uh, this quote from Adair Turner is very instructive for me. It says, monetary financing was a, a taboo to print money in order to finance deficits has the status of a mortal sin, right? So we go, go into a lot of sort of moralizing uh, arguments or questions of morality there. Uh, Jens Weidmann, who was in charge of the uh, Bundesbank, part of the Euro system of the European Central Bank, called it the work of, of the devil, which I think is a very interesting metaphor to think through, uh, as much as a, as a technical error. Well, if, if that's the kind of idea that uh, buying government debt uh, is the work of the devil, uh, apparently we live in di diabolical times. Uh, we have seen over the last three to four months a lot more uh, public voices calling for a, a return to monetary financing, although qualified one way or another. And I'll discuss in a second why there is an evolution in the way in which we think about the relationship between the central bank and the treasury in the form of monetary financing. That is, the monetary financing is, is a very different animal from what we used to have. Uh, this is... Um, uh, Martin Wolf talking about uh, monetary financing after Bank of England recognized uh, sort of one way or another quite reluctantly that buying government debt more or less amounts to monetary financing. We have seen a, a couple, uh, several other um, sort of high level policy wonks discussing the idea of uh, breaking the taboo of the central bank buying uh, government debt. And uh, I want to talk about this uh, um, taboo of monetary financing as something that uh, has not always been a taboo, right? Uh, we have had institutional arrangements in macroeconomic policy where the central bank used to be in a much closer relationship with the treasury, with the min ministry of finance, or with the fiscal authority. And here I want to use a, an, an IMF working paper from 2014 that shows uh, historically since the 1900s how uh, central banks have moved closer or further away from uh, the fiscal authority in terms of holding their um, uh, uh, de the debt issued. And what we see here with a, uh, red, in a red circle is the share of central bank holdings that starts from 
uh, sort of the age of the, from the Second World War and goes up to the 1980s. And you see there that as public debt to GDP ratios increase uh, in the Second World War, as governments have to finance their uh, war expenditures, uh, what we see is central banks becoming uh, or coming closer, doing a lot of monetary uh, financing. And this share starts to fall after the 1980s, and it starts to fall uh, because we move towards a very different macroeconomic paradigm, and I'll explain in a second why this is important. But this is the, the, the age where we turn towards what I would call financial capitalism, is the age where uh, the central bank becomes independent. The, the mandate of independence specifically requires the central bank to stop monetizing uh, government debt, uh, except, and I will bracket here, if you're, if you're interested, we can touch upon, upon it in the question and answer session, when it's doing open market operations for uh, uh, its interest rate policy, it may buy outright government debt, but with a, with a very, uh, on, on a very small scale compared to uh, sort of historical trends, right? So what we see is an increase and then a decline. Let me see if my mouth works, yes, an increase uh, and then a decline in uh, central banks' uh, uh, engagement in monetary financing. And this goes hand in hand, and if you look at the, the other graph, this goes hand in hand with a, a, a change in composition of the holders of government debt. As central banks move away from government bond markets, what we see is increasingly non-residents, that is, uh, fin financial institutions, be their uh, banks or non-bank financial institutions, including the shadow banking sector, become much more important holders of government debt uh, than, uh, than central banks, right? So we have gone already through a first stage of monetary financing uh, between the 1940s and the 1970s, roughly. Uh, and afterwards, we go. It, we have been in an age of central bank independence or financial capitalism, in which the central bank steps back, uh, and uh, private investors, particularly uh, private financial investors, become uh, far more uh, important. Now, uh, what in order to make sense of the fact that we are, I think we are returning to an age of monetary financing, and I'll show you in a second some uh, data to support that. I, I, I want us to differentiate between two types of monetary financing regimes, right? And I, I call them, I distinguish them as promotional monetary financing and prudential monetary financing. In other words, they, the, the logic of buying government debt by the, central, by the central bank is not the same in these two types of regimes. And let me start with the first one because I've already discussed it. This pro, to my mind, this promotional monetary financing uh, that we've had from the 1940s to the 1970s uh, had a very specific objective. It came within a sort of broader accumulation regime of industrial capitalism. Uh, it was very closely aligned with or, uh, industrial policies or, or with a developmental state that had particular aims in terms of going up value chains or export promotion. The idea of central banks intervening and buying of bonds in this uh, uh, promotional regime was to keep the costs at which governments borrow low in order to reduce the uh, interest rate uh, uh, payments uh, or the pressure of uh, servicing the debt. And there was a specific institutional hierarchy uh, where it is the fiscal authority that develops an industrial strategy or a developmental state uh, logic and there is an explicit form of coordination where the central bank steps in, but it is subordinated to the overall broader needs of, of the developmental state or of some form of industrial strategy. And in macroeconomic policy, we refer to this kind of paradigm as a um, Keynesian uh, paradigm where the fiscal policy is in some ways in, in the driving seat, right? Uh, where we are heading now, I think, is a very different kind of regime, uh, one in which we still have, we, or we are going back to monetary financing, that is the, the central bank starts to buy again quite a bit of uh, government uh, debt and to hold it on, on its balance sheet, but it does so for a, a, through a very different logic, and I call this a prudential monetary financing regime. Uh, one in which uh, the purpose or the objective of buying government debt is not as much trying to keep government uh, um, financing costs low in order to support some sort of broader logic of structural transformation of the economy, but it has to do with financial stability. It has to do with financial stability because in a world uh, organized uh, through financial capitalism or financial globalization, however you want to call it, 
the government bond becomes very important as a an asset that supports credit creation through bond markets. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a second. So there are financial stability reasons to try to, to intervene in government bond markets. And there, uh, the logic of intervention is to preserve liquidity. And we've seen that uh, with uh, Mario Draghi's, for example, whatever it takes. We've seen that uh, with the interventions of the Federal Reserve in March this year, as the COVID crisis starts, uh, or the COVID pandemic becomes global. We have seen that with uh, Christine Lagarde's idea that we have to target spreads in the Eurozone to, to Germany. And the overall logic of this uh, intervention under a prudential monetary financing regime is that the, the central bank makes uh, markets or in government bonds, but as a last resort. It is there to promote the liquidity of these markets in order to promote financial stability. The institutional hierarchy doesn't change at all in the sense that it is, cent it is central bank led. Uh, it, is, it can be consistent with, even with a policy of austerity. It doesn't require any form of uh, industrial strategy or any sort of broader ambitions of uh, uh, structural transformation. It comes with, within the broad aims of an inflation targeting regime, even at, uh, when interest rates are low at, uh, uh, or at the zero lower bound. And I think this is where we're heading towards a prudential monetary financing regime that whose institutional foundations are being established uh, as we speak one way or, or one way or another. And I want us to think through what would it take as progressive uh, economists or progressive activists uh, in order to uh, either change this prudential uh, monetary financing regime to change its, its logic or to return towards a more promotional monetary financing regime, particularly in the context of discussing transitions to a low carbon economy. Uh, what I want to do first, uh, however, is to, to talk a bit more about this the, the historical uh, evolution. How, do, how did we get to a prudential monetary financing regime? Uh, and I guess we can identify very broadly three stages. Let me see how I'm doing for time. Uh, in the first stage is pretty well known in the history of economic ideas and the history of macroeconomic policy. It comes with me, the success of Milton Friedman and of neoliberalism in, gener in general uh, in, a, in sort of demolishing the, the conceptual basis of promotional monetary financing regimes. That is uh, arguments that the central bank monetizing government debt generates inflation, it supports populist uh, uh, fiscal policy making, and in a sense, it is a um, uh, um, uh, it destroys the ability of macroeconomic policy to deliver on any kind of uh, economic stability that is necessary. And that's a stage that sort of uh, most countries went through in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, once we get over this, uh, the success of this idea of uh, central bank independence, right? Because this is what it brings with it. It brings the idea of central bank independence. Once this uh, success of central bank independence uh, discourse is, is well established, in parallel with that, we have very important structural changes in financial markets. And this is something that is very important to the kind of research that I'm doing to look at how evolutionary changes in finance articulate with the institutions of macroeconomic policy. And in the second stage, what we are seeing is that private finance, uh, and here I want to think about private finance in the sense of uh, financial systems increasingly organized around uh, bond markets, capital markets, around repo markets and, and derivatives ma uh, markets. This private financial system becomes an intermediary of the relationship between central bank and the fiscal authority. And here I want to bracket out the conversations that you have in uh, uh, MMT, in modern uh, mod monetary theory, about uh, the ways in which all uh, fiscal spending in, comes bef uh, or all, all uh, government spending in one way or another is money financed. I want to unpack here the, the black box of the institutional relationship between the central bank and the fiscal authority, assuming uh, that this institutional relationship evolves over time and, and matters, right? So in, in this uh, second stage where private finance becomes an, uh, an intermediary, it does so because we have an independent central bank. The treasury is forced to go into the uh, government bond market in order to borrow and replenish the accounts at the central bank where it's spent first, right? Uh, which is consistent with an MMT story. And 
where the, the Treasury, because it wants to have liquid government bond market, it's increasingly relies on the repo market to get that liquidity, because the repo market uh, allows uh, financial institutions to use government bonds as, as collateral. It allows them to take positions in, in government bonds. And therefore, you have a narrative of liquidity that comes from uh, anchoring sovereign bond markets in in, rep in repo markets. And that's something that happened within, in the 90s and, and, and 2000s. And as we get this increasing shift towards market-based finance, and uh, as we get this increasing role of private finance as a, a linchpin, an intermediary between the central bank and the fiscal authority, we see sovereign debt emerging as a safe collateral for market-based finance. It is a core asset that is used for pricing, that is used for uh, building leverage and liquidity, uh, liquidity cycles. Uh, it is used as, as collateral. Um, and of course, uh, Ben Brown argues, this is what uh, sort of grounds an infrastructure of power for private finance in the sense that the, the orderly functioning of both monetary policy and fiscal policy very much depends on uh, the ability of, uh, and the, the good functioning of uh, shadow banking or shadow markets like uh, the repo market. Uh, now, disorderly functioning obviously is uh, desirable, but uh, the fact that we get much more pronounced leverage and liquidity cycles in this, this type of market-based finance also uh, requires structurally a change in the relationship between the central bank and sovereign debt. And here we have in stage three, which I, I would guess starts around the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers and becomes more and more institutionalized uh, as we come closer to the COVID pandemic, uh, the central bank uh, implicitly and then explicitly assumes the role of a market maker of, of last resort. This is how the Bank of England, for example, uh, institutionally describes itself since 2015. And the logic here is, is, is prudential, right? The idea is central banks will intervene in government bond markets in order to preserve the liquidity there. And the preserving liquidity is important because the entire edifice of a market-based financial system depends on liquid and, uh, and uh, in, 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 in practice, um, uh, low interest rate um, government bonds. So that's very important to stabilize collateral-based financing. And what I argue in, in a recent paper in Finance and Society, we have here a central bank regime that de-risks collateral, particularly government bond collateral, but all sorts of other types of, uh, of assets. And this uh, prudential monetary financing regime uh, first appears in high-income countries because structurally finance uh, is much more market-based there. Uh, it is first institutionalized formally with the Bank of England, but now it's moving more and more towards uh, emerging countries with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I, I just want to stress that having the central bank as a market maker of last resort or doing monetary financing, however you want to call it, is not necessary, it doesn't necessarily require fiscal activism. It's also consistent with the austerity or with a very neoliberal state that doesn't want to interfere too much in the allocation of uh, capital to uh, the private uh, uh, economy. Okay, and I wanted to show you here uh, um, some evidence, which I, th I thought quite surprisingly how quickly the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the shift towards this prudential monetary financing regime. Here from a, a recent uh, Vox EU article with lots of authors, so uh, and I'm not going to cite their names, but you can uh, go and uh, read their post. And we see here a lot of central banks in, in what we might describe as emerging countries, although there are some debates there, have uh, announced outright interventions in, uh, in secondary government bond markets or sovereign bond markets in order to preserve their, uh, their liquidity, right? So this more, uh, market maker of last resort, this potential, potential monetary financing regime is becoming increasingly normalized across high income countries uh, and across uh, uh, emerging and I would guess pretty soon uh, low income countries uh, as well. Now, because I was told that I only have uh, 15 minutes, I'll, I'll try to finish by thinking about, uh, is it consistent uh, in terms of uh, the kind of progressive questions that we can ask about, particularly about uh, how do we deal with a climate crisis uh, in the context of, of the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, increase in public debt to GDP ratios, is it consistent to have a, um, prudential macro um, sort of monetary fin uh, financing regime, or we need to go back to some to the, to the original logic of central banks uh, and monetary policy being much closer to uh, the fiscal authority, 
than we had during neoliberalism, and that is to go back to some form of promotional monetary financing regime. And I want to uh, start by uh, reminding ourselves that, in general, Green New Deals or Green Deals as in the, in, in the European Union or transitions to low carbon economies require structural transformations of the economy. In other words, require a much stronger state, to my mind, and this is we can argue uh, whether uh, or we debate whether that's, that's the case or not, but it requires a structural transformations of economies with a, a bigger state. Uh, it also requires, uh, and there are several, several st steps or several uh, things that need to change for the structural transformation to uh, accelerate in a way that is consistent with uh, properly addressing the climate crisis. And uh, I want to mention several, um, um, several of these uh, necessary movements uh, that I think are in or inconsistent with a promotional um, with a prudential uh, monetary financing regime. First, uh, the global finance, remember we still live in an age of financial capitalism, uh, the COVID-19 interventions uh, have extended a global safety net for, for private finance uh, that I, th I think it's still a, a very powerful backstop. Uh, in order to move towards a, a low carbon transition, we need to green global finance. And that re doesn't only require a green finance taxonomies. And here by taxonomy, I mean a, a ca categories that, that differentiate uh, or classifications that differentiate between green assets, that is uh, loans or bonds issued by uh, financial institutions to companies that are doing uh, green activities or activities that are low carbon and dirty finance. So that is dirty finance. It's also known as brown finance, but I'm not using the brown, term brown finance anymore because I was convinced that this is, it has racist connotations and we should drop it. Uh, but it has to distinguish between green and dirty finance so that central banks can start uh, penalizing dirty finance uh, and making sure that uh, the uh, high carbon activities and fossil fuel activities are no longer uh, benefiting from uh, implicit subsidies from uh, the central bank and from the private fin financial system. So that requires us to reduce the infrastructural power of finance because it requires a very profound transformation of the global financial system. I think equally important, we will need a green developmental state. And to get a green developmental state that is able to redirect resources into low carbon activities, it's very important to have uh, new mechanisms of coordination between the central bank and the treasury, where particularly, remember I, to I told you about this, uh, the, the hierarchy of institutions within macroeconomic policy, the hierarchy of institutions need to change where we have again the Treasury or the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Green Economy, however we want to call it, it has to be in charge of designing the transition and uh, designing uh, uh, and financing uh, activities either through state-owned companies or through private companies, but financing activities that are, are green. And uh, these new mechanisms of coordination, I think, require a, a promotional uh, monetary financing regime where the central bank is subordinated and takes instructions in order to keep financing costs for the state as low as possible. And here, even if we, you hear uh, debate or uh, policy statements around uh, yield curve targeting, uh, I, would, uh, I would caution against that because yield curve, ta yield curve, tar yield curve targeting, which is uh, what the uh, um, Bank of Japan is doing, what the Federal Reserve is contemplating in doing, is very much consistent with a, a, a regime of uh, prudential monetary financing where the, the ultimate logic is still pre preserving the financial stability of uh, financial capitalism as opposed to uh, engineering or helping engineer the transition to a low carbon econo uh, economy. And to finish with that, I think we also have to take into account that a, a progressive monetary policy that is framed within a promotional monetary financing regime requires a, a better state that is able to design this uh, green transition. So we need a, a green technocracy both within, within central banks and, and within, uh, within the treasury. And we need a political bargain that enlists the elites one way or another in, in delivering on this. OK, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm, I'm happy to take questions um, or, or clarifications if that is necessary. And I will stop sharing my screen, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, 
yeah I, I, before we go into the questions i i had some um more some questions to clarify what, what you just have been talking about um because uh yeah we all already had some questions some very basic questions on what monetary financing is uh um so yeah uh, i i had some questions about the the two types of the two regimes that you presented the the promotional monetary financing regime and the prudential monetary financing regime just just to make uh, sure that I, I understood what you were talking about mm -hmm. uh, so basically what you're saying is that when when we talk about monetary financing so when central banks uh, finance the expenditure of the state directly as opposed mm -hmm. of buying uh, assets from from investors mm -hmm. uh, so um, that it matters in uh, the, uh, in what type of institutional context this occurs so yes. uh, you, you can have an in, in, institutional context that we had uh, in the post-war period uh, governed by the Keynesian political economic principles uh, not that much capital mobility um well other uh, other priorities than in 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 in, in then from the from the 70s onwards and in in this uh, period the institutional structure was such that uh, central banks were dealing directly uh, with uh, with the state apparatus and mm -hmm. then in the in the in the in the period of finance capital financialization increasingly you see the emergence of uh, the financial sector, financial markets, key financial agents, well, growing their infrastructural power uh, and becoming an intermediary or part of how everything is allocated and, and well, how it is operated. Is, is, that, uh, is that right to, to, to put it in that way? So that in, in, in the first period, it's basically much more central bank being integrated and part of the state apparatus, uh, whereby politicians can much more easily direct what ha will happen to uh, monetary policies, uh, prioritize, for instance, industrial policy, industri uh, prioritize uh, unemployment, uh, and whereas in the second, it's much more market mediated, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and markets have a, a, a much larger and much more critical say in how this whole how this finance will be allocated is that uh, a way to summarize your 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 message yes yes i think it's a it's a very good uh, summary rodrigo thank you very much uh, yes i i think uh, i mean the 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 sort of question at the back of my mind when i i thought about this distinction between uh, promotional and prudential right it was uh, how do we make sense of the fact that central banks are returning to government bond markets in, in such uh, a, a significant way, right? Uh, remember, the, the historical period that we're looking at uh, starts from, um, let's say, the, I mean, in the graph that I showed you, starts from the 1900s, but in terms of the relationship between the, the central bank and the treasury, it starts from the 1940s and comes all the way to 2020, right? And we had three broad periods where, uh, for a very long period of time, the central bank had a, held a lot of government debt on, on its balance sheet. Then these government debt holdings start to, start to fall, and now they are increasing again, right? So it's very tempting to think, oh, we are going back to the 1950s, 70s, we are going back to the uh, age of uh, Keynesian aggregate demand management, and we're going back to the period of financial repression, right? This is how uh, McKinnon and Shaw used to think about it. it this is a financially repressed economy, and a financially repressed capitalism, where basically uh, what matters for um, the uh, economic uh, development of a country and the growth of a country, what matters is how the central bank and the treasury work together. Okay, uh, w where we are now, it's it doesn't have the same logic in the sense that the private financial system is still very important as a part of a triangle with the central bank and and the treasury. And because it's so important, then the logic of central bank intervention in sovereign bond markets, the logic of monetary financing and, and the politics of monetary financing changes very dramatically, right? And it changes very dramatically in the sense that the central bank is still in the driving seat. It, it still has complete autonomy over how much it buys and when, right? This is why we listen to Lagarde 
saying we'll target the spreads, but we don't know what exactly the uh, spreads will target between, say, Italian and German government bonds. Uh, we hear about yield targeting, but it is, the, it is within the autonomy and the preserve of an independent central bank to establish the parameters of monetary financing. It is not up to the government to establish these parameters. And why does this matter? It matters on a political level because uh, it tells us what it is possible to do as an active fiscal authority, what it is possible to do, particularly in an age where public debt to GDP ratios are exploding because of COVID. And I think this distinction is important because it uh, brings us back to, to sort of more broader questions of how do we engineer green transitions, which to, to my mind is the, is the most pressing question that we have now. And of course, if we continue with, with a kind of uh, regime that we had in financial capitalism since the, the late 1990s, if we continue with this prudential monetary financing regime, we will not get governments becoming ambitious in terms of engineering a, a green transition because there is no well-defined uh, uh, institution or, or parameters of coordination between the central bank and the government. I, if I'm the minister of finance, I cannot say I'm going to start a, a, a crazily large Green New Deal program if I don't know whether my central bank will be supportive in terms of stabilizing my borrowing costs, right? Where I, and if the central and from the perspective of the central bank, uh, I uh, the central bank in this prudential regime says, well, uh, of course I have to stabilize uh, and I have to preserve the liquidity of of government bond markets because otherwise my entire financial system will collapse. And then if the financial system collapses, then the monetary policy transmission mechanism doesn't work anymore and we get recessions, etc. But I'm not interested in your Green New Deal stuff. That is your problem. You do it within the parameters of, of, a, of, a, of a, a, even of fiscal austerity, right? You cut can, somewhere. Can I, can, can I just, just to clarify, uh, ask another question? So what you're, what you're, at, what you're saying is that if we, if we want to have an effective monetary policy in a, in a, in a global Green New Deal, uh, uh, yeah, what, what, what is necessary is, is not simply um, monetary financing, but uh, monetary financing as part of a, well, what you could say, a re regime change. Uh, yes. uh, and, and, and without a regime change, um, you, the quantity of monetary financing will not be channeled or produced in the right way. Yes. I mean, it is not very clear. So where we are now is that the monetary financing is, is, is becoming fashionable again, but it is becoming fashionable under the terms that established and defined entirely by the central bank, right? The Ministry of the Treasury or the Ministry of Finance, I mean, how many of them did you hear in the, Euro, in the Eurozone debates coming and saying, oh, please, uh, can we agree on what would be my preferred level of the interest rate? It is possible that these discussions are held behind closed doors, we don't know, uh, but in, in public this is not the way in which this conversation is being conducted as an explicit coordination between the central bank and uh, the, the fiscal authority. It is within, it is the central bank that, that decides, right? And that's important because uh, it sort of uh, restrains or it constrains the room for maneuver that fiscal authorities have, particularly in terms of thinking ambitiously about Green New Deals. And I think this is very important. I mean, when people talk about Green New Deals, there are all sorts of hopes and all sorts of uh, ambitions laid out. But as a macroeconomist, I would say no Green Deal is possible without a profound change in the way in which we organize our uh, institutional relationships between different macroeconomic policy institutions. If we don't change macroeconomic policy arrangements, we can't get Green New Deals. I, I also, I'm kind of um, hesitant whether we can get a Green New Deal within financial capitalism, but that's, uh, I don't know, well, that's another question. Well, but, but thank you. This is, I think, a, a key insight. Uh, we shouldn't talk about more or less, but a different type of, of monetary financing. Uh, and yeah, I, I would like to, uh, well, give Sarah uh, uh, the possibility to ask some questions. Yeah, so uh, there's also a lot of questions and very interesting questions actually in the uh, Q&A uh, session. 
Um, so I'd like to ask all attendees if you have, have uh, a question, please put it in the uh, Q&A tab and uh, not in the chat. That's easier for us to, uh, to to monitor and then you can also endorse the questions there. So, but before we go to your questions, I also have some uh, questions, Daniela. I'll try to keep it short because uh, okay. there's all, already so much uh, to be discussed. Uh, so yeah, you're quite critical of uh, the European Green Deal. You're also critical of the of the taxonomy, so the classification system of green assets of the European Commission. And you also warn for uh, greenwashing. And I think that's very uh, justified. Uh, but I also want to look at how to finance uh, green investments uh, and green ideas. So if they would be good, what would be the, the right way to finance, right? Once we have the, the right targets and objectives. So uh, I think you're also critical of the way uh, the Green Deal is shaped now in terms of how to finance it, because uh, private capital, private finance plays an important role there, right? It functions as a yeah. lever for more public finance. And yeah. you also fear that this way of financing will um, enrich the already rich and maybe even increase inequality. Uh, so I guess the answer then must be uh, there must be more public finance, right? So uh, what is public finance? What is public capital? And how can that actually ensure a, a green transition without financing uh, the already wealthy uh, class? And do you think this is primarily the role of governments or is this also uh, to up to central banks and to uh, investment banks? either on the European level or on the national level. So what are the actors to finance this uh, green transition, according to you? Hmm. OK, uh, thank you. So I, I just want to start by saying that there are debates in the, in the sort of green finance uh, discussions that I've been sort of uh, following for the last year and a half. Uh, there are two. There are, uh, two types of debates. One, one debate is monetary versus fiscal policy, right? And, the, and, and when we put it to central banks in the various projects that I work on, uh, you should green your balance sheet. You should green your unconventional monetary policy interventions. You should green your collateral framework. That is, as central banks operate now, in, um, including in their monetary financing, although I'm, I would bracket that question for a second, but as central banks operate now, they follow markets in designing their collateral framework, in identifying what assets to purchase in unconventional monetary policy measures. And there is a very significant market failure there because private financial markets do not price properly climate risk. They can't, right? So far, I mean, they, they can't and they haven't been very willing to because it changes very dramatically the way in which, uh, it would change dramatically the way in which prices in financial markets uh, move. Right, they don't so, have an interest, right? Because it would yeah. it would mean tough luck for them and less uh, interest. Yes, exactly. It would produce a lot of stranded assets, right? For example, right. if yeah. you want to include climate risk in assets that you have uh, in fossil fuel assets, then these will become either stranded in the sense that you will have to recognize that these assets will, will become non-performing at some point and it will make losses for you. Uh, or uh, they would increase the cost of financing for uh, dirty companies and uh, a lot of the, the, the sort of most financial activity, particularly in the corporate bond market and in equity markets in the exchange traded fund market, is most financial activity is sort of captured or, or organized around companies that, have, uh, that are either fossil fuel or have a significant fossil fuel component or a significant high carbon component, right? So you can't expect private finance to, to on its own, uh, green itself because the, the, the profit incentives are not there. The time horizon, there is a tragedy of horizons there in the sense that the time horizon that, that governs uh, private finance is not the same as the hor uh, kind of horizon that governs the, the climate crisis. So the, the, the debate then is you can't, uh, this is what central banks tell us, well, you can, we have to preserve market neutrality. We can't be seen to, to be uh, preferring one sector or another because we would be doing industrial policy then. Yeah. We'd rather follow markets. Of course, we accept that there is a market failure in pricing climate risks. But what to do? Uh, we think that it should be the government that is in the driving seat and should do green fiscal policies because this will be much more effective and also will have much more democratic legitimacy than asking us uh, technocrats in, in central banks to take political decisions about uh, the climate crisis, right? So that's one debate. I'm, I'm not very convinced about this debate. Uh, 
in the sense uh, that it somehow assumes that central banks or these apolitical institutions who simply are uh, in the business of a sort of a guiding or accompanying uh, private financial markets in their more or less good functioning. I don't think that's the case, right? So monetary policy already subsidizes dirty assets because it doesn't uh, uh, price climate risks in the same way that private finance doesn't pr uh, price climate risks. And secondly, I think if the financial stability mandate of the central bank is to be taken seriously, right, then climate risks are part of a financial stability mandate and the central bank should have, to have to be act even within the old paradigm of an independent central bank that only uh, targets price stability. So that's one argument. Whether fiscal policy would be more effective in triggering a faster uh, uh, transition, I guess here to me that is a political question, right? Because the politics of trying to finance green transitions can go, can, can go both ways. In one scenario of financing the green transition, you could have a central bank that works very closely with the government and says, from now on, I am going to, to take a very strict definition of what is a green asset and what is a dirty asset, and I'm going to impose a series of rules and I'm, and I'm going to penalize these uh, dirty assets by, for example, increasing uh, or eliminating them uh, from the uh, eligible collateral pool for monetary policy purposes, or I'm going to slap some capital requirements on them. There, there are lots of things that, that one can do. And, and that would be I, breaking with the current regime, right? Because we're it would be breaking recessions that actually the fossil industry is getting subsidies right so i mean it would be breaking with the existing uh, sort of dirty monetary policy that we have at the moment because we have in a sense it is dirty in the sense that it is not green uh, in the sense that it, it does not prom uh, support uh, green finance and it particularly it does not think very carefully about greenwashing right so that, but the problem here, and this is the, the politics comes in, the central banks are very reluctant to, to adopt very strong rules uh, in order to green finance, because first they would have to come up with a, with a proper taxonomy. And second, they would, the, the, their political nature would become much more overtly visible. So then this, this is something that goes against the institutional interest of central banks. And, and the distinction that I make between this promotional and prudential monetary financing is very important in political terms because it tells us that in the prudential monetary financing regime, you can still claim to be an independent central bank. You can preserve your claim to independence, your claim to technocracy, your claim to being apolitical, because you're saying, oh, I'm only buying off my bonds because private finance requires me to do financial stability. Uh, whereas in, in the old regime of promotional monetary financing, what you have there is an explicit recognition that the central bank is part of the state. It, it has to work with the other arm of the state, with the fiscal arm of the state, in order to deliver on some democratically decided uh, um, goals that in, that in this case can be a green goal, right? So in that sense, uh, Going back to your question of whether we need more uh, public debt uh, in order to finance the transition, we, we probably do, but if we, there is political willingness to green finance very rapidly, you could also have a very massive shift in private, finance, uh, private capital allocation from dirty activities to green activities if there is political willingness to properly regulate and properly green finance. So in a sense, you don't need a lot more public debt if you have the political willingness to green finance, but here is where the infrastructural power of the private financial system comes in. And as long as we have infrastructural power of private finance, I don't think there will be political willingness. So in a sense, you can't get private finance to green unless you change the macroeconomic institutional arrangement, unless you go back to this promotional monetary financing logic. So you need a, another monetary regime to have a, an effective green monetary policy and the right type of green monetary policy can also be a catalyst to achieve this uh, re regime change. Yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, it's already uh, 48, so we have only uh, 12 minutes left. Um, and there are 23 questions. So, so uh, maybe we can take another like five or 10 minutes extra if that's okay with you. Yeah, um, we can. Do it. If you don't have somewhere to go, uh, Daniela, then perhaps we can the, take it. The British pubs only open tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So <laughs> oh. then I can be here. <laughs> um, 
but still, we, we, we have a lot of questions, so we will not be able to answer them all, obviously. Okay, go. Uh, let's, let, uh, let's not talk about the yeah. questions. Let, yeah. Let's but, uh, so, um, Sarah, you, would you like to start with the first question? Yes. So I'll start with uh, Giuliano Palaschino. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, who's uh, on top of the list. So the most endorsed question, which is, do you see, Daniela, the validity of your case for monetary financing as being dependent upon the persistence of low levels of inflation? That is, do we see promotional monetary financing as a temporary measure which is desirable under specific circumstances, e.g. low inflation, or do you see it as a policy tool which should be a permanent, integral part of any macroeconomic regime? Very clear question, I think. Yes, I, very clear and, and very challenging in many ways because, of course, uh, the, the, the first question that any monetarist would ask you uh, when we talk about prudent, uh, promotional monetary financing or a much closer relationship between the central bank and the treasury is what happens to inflation? How do you make sure that this is not going back to the Keynesian old days of uh, high inflation that is triggered by populist governments? And, and that's a very valid question and something that we need to grapple with here. I mean, not everybody has the answers. And I guess there will be, I, th my answers would have, would be first in a paper, <clears throat> uh, that I've, uh, well, not a paper, a journal, a newspaper, a social, social Europe, in a social Europe post that I did with Ben Brown and Ben Lamont. It's we on our website, about, actually. It's it is on our website. website. We yeah. talked about the possibility that central banks could start to learn, to, should start to learn to love uh, green inflation. That is the idea that some uh, products and activities that come from high carbon should increase in price, and that shouldn't be a problem, right? The, if they become more expensive, that's okay, because then we would have automatically a reallocation of resources towards green activities. And the overall logic of a green promotional monetary financing regime would be to make sure that we are engineering as fast as possible a structural transformation of the economy. That's one question. The second question is, there is a long debate, and I don't want, I, we don't have time to go into it, about what are the drivers of inflation in general and what are the potential drivers of inflation at, at this particular junction in in uh, economic uh, this particular economic moment and i'm not so convinced that there is an argument to be made that having a larger central bank balance sheet uh, that is having more money in the central bank money in the system that is one way or another monetizing public debt will be necessarily infl inflationary. I think of inflation as the consequence of many other political struggles between uh, uh, capital and labor, and that they, these uh, political struggles can be managed in different ways, but not necessarily with monetary policy. So I think uh, it's a longer uh, um, uh, debate. I would just answer to Giuliano that I don't think monetary, uh, pr promotional monetary financing should be a temporary measure. I mean, that's already in some ways how some central banks are, are, are framing it. And the problem with doing temporary measures is that it doesn't change the underlying political, um, in a sense, political bargain between the central bank and the treasury that we have at the moment and that we've had over the last 30 years. And I don't think that political bargain can generate the kind of uh, mo political momentum for a green transition. It, any other political bargain was, would come with its own economic problems, potentially including inflation, but that's something that we need to think through carefully. Just a clarification question here is when you, when you say that inflation is, is, uh, is also produced by a, well, a broader set of, of, of issues, struggles uh, in, in the political economy, um, are there Turner, uh, um, well, in, in his book Between the Debt and the Devil, um, when, he's, when he talks about monetary financing, he also includes that this can only be done, executed, if uh, banks, uh, capital uh, reserves are, are, are made higher so that banks cannot recycle or uh, multiply this monetary financing and, and enlarging uh, inflation. So do, do, you, do you also see that monetary financing also in a part of a Green New Deal should, come, should, should go hand in hand with curbing uh, banks and, and the ability of banks to to give out such a large private uh, private debt. Well, I guess my, my the logic of of promotional monetary financing that that I'm discussing within the framework of a of a green tra transition or a low carbon transition, in some ways requires 
shrinking the financial system, I, either shrinking it through green rules or shrinking it through all sorts of other uh, regulatory me measures like uh, capital requirements. I wouldn't put it exactly in the way that you did, Rodrigo, because I think there is some monetary logic there that says, well, capital requirements determine the pace of credit expansion. I think the mm -hmm. story is far more complicated than that. That but is their sure, Turner, that's uh, his, his uh, yeah. Yes, okay, let's- No fighting here, no fighting. <laughs> no, 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 I just- uh, <laughs> We are, we are not fighting, we are disagreeing on what Adair Turner might have said. Um, I would just say um, that, that in a sense, uh, changing the, the direction and, and the, the practices of credit allocation by the banking system and the shadow banking system are necessary uh, are, are a necessary part of a, prom uh, of a promotional monetary fi uh, financing regime for central banks. The, the, it can't happen otherwise, um, no. so yeah. Should we go to another question? Yes, it's um, your turn. Let me, what, which one is on top? Uh, okay, so again, a difficult question to uh, to pronounce. Oh, sorry, another question. Um, sorry, it's... Um, I think it's Michelle it, Groenewald, right? Yeah, it's Michelle Groenewald. Uh, I would be really interested to hear Daniela's opinion on how we convince colleagues to acknowledge and teach that monetary and fiscal policy is not just a technical matter, but that there is an inherently political aspect to this. And, well, there's some questions related to it, but this is the, the main question. I I think that's a that's a very good question, and it's also a very difficult question uh, that can have. A, I, I'm I'm fairly optimistic about it in the sense that um, when central banks start speaking about monetary financing again, you know, academic economists will will have to start thinking about it, even if they don't come from the kind of political economy tradition that I come from, where I'm interested in in these questions of the politics of coordination between the central bank and and uh, and the treasury. Uh, of course, uh, there is a, a bit of a high hill or a steep hill to climb in the sense that uh, talking about this relationship also requires one to educate oneself about how uh, market-based finance works and why it is important to think about the infrastructure power of finance within, within that uh, framework. Uh, but I think we are, we are going there and I think there is a, a much um, more significant willingness to engage I also think uh, I want to encourage people to start uh, thinking not only about the technical uh, and political aspects of monetary and fiscal policy, but also to start thinking about the technical aspects and the political aspects of private finance. And this discussion of taxonomies, we touched upon a bit of, upon it. To me, uh, uh, there was an MEP, a member of the European Parliament, who said recently that a taxonomy of green finance is the single most important thing that happened to private finance since accounting was introduced. And I, I mean, I, she was part of the, the MEPs that, that passed that law through the parliament. So I guess there is some scope for being uh, uh, a bit bombastic about it, but it's not that bombastic. We, we are now living in an age where the rules of uh, green finance are being written and there aren't many people who are present and, and, and participate in these po very political debates who are not either part of private finance or who are not part of the technocracy from the commission, for example, or from the central banks who need to grapple with this question. So I I would very much support this, uh, Michelle's, I'm not going to even try to pronounce your second name, uh, Michelle's call for, uh, for uh, constantly repoliticizing and reminding people that both, Fiscal policy obviously is, is political. I mean, people, I think the problem in some ways that people treat fiscal policy as way too political and monetary policy as, as way too depoliticized. Uh, you you don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's good to have uh, BlackRock uh, uh, write the the taxonomy? Of, <laughs> it's an, it, it... Well, no, <laughs> I I would I would rather that some uh, uh, dull uh, technocrats write uh, 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 the taxonomy instead of some dull uh, financiers. But yes. So, yeah, I think uh, this is also why Crash Course was invented, right? To create a critical mass and to politicize the thinking and understanding of, of money and monetary policy, right? Because we cannot leave it to, uh, to Blacklock and uh, neither to technocrats, I would say. So next question is by uh, Zhao Silva. Uh, Dear Professor Gabor, my name is Gabriel. Sorry, that's, that's in the question. So it's maybe it's Gabriel. 
uh, and I'm speaking from Brasilia, Brazil. I've been studying monetary policy and its uh, relations to law. Even though we are totally aware of this recent shift in monetary policy approach, we are constantly backstopped by the consensus with one concernment, inflation. That's what you spoke about. So mm -hmm. generally say that MMT, uh, which is modern money theory, monetary theory, maybe you can explain that because I don't think everyone knows what it is. So generally they say that MMT and a more active role played by the central bank is rich country stuff and can't be applied to developing economies. What do you think about it? Yes, I think it's clear. And I would just start by saying that I, I don't want to uh, engage in a, in a debate on MMT. I have very good friends in the MMT world, and I think they've done us all a very great favor in political terms and in, te in technical terms, because they have made visible uh, the, the mechanics of the relationship between the central bank and the treasury uh, in, in a way that hasn't been done in a very long time. And I am very grateful to them. I think there are several points of disagreement that we, we can have, particularly, I think it is important for us to go through this black box of the institutional relationship between the central bank and the treasury, when the treasury ultimately does go to sovereign bond markets in order to issue debt, that is very important and that has to be part of the story. Now, how does this work for emerging countries? Uh, Gabriel, as you have uh, seen in one of the slides that I put there, I think more emerging countries are sort of overcoming the taboo of you can't monetize government debt because they, this will make us all Venezuela, I guess, in Brazil uh, and everywhere in Latin America. The moment you say monetary financing, uh, people say Venezuela. Uh, I think Venezuela uh, is the kind of argument that basically stops any conversation and, and uh, it's a very unfair one because the Venezuelan economic policy is, is much more complicated than printing money or Zimbabwe for, for that matter. And it has a lot to do with political conflicts over, uh, and, and struggles over, over resources, over uh, structural capacity of the economy rather than a simply money financing story. However, I, I want to recognize that there are uh, very significant uh, constraints in the way in which monetary policy autonomy and prudential monetary uh, and promotional monetary financing can happen in, in emerging countries simply because we have 30 years of, uh, of, a, of a monetary policy regime and of, of a fiscal policy regime where we are told that it's good for non-resident financial investors to hold our debt and it's good to have liquidity in markets and it's good to be credible to international markets and to move away from this logic of credibility to international markets is very difficult because it really requires a very significant restructuring of the paradigm but my, my message here in terms of the the, the insistence on uh, uh, this idea of promotion monetary financing is to say that just saying monetized government debt is not enough it's not enough. It has to go hand in hand with a massive increase in the, cap in the technocratic and political ability of the state to conduct uh, economic policies and to conduct green industrial policies. And th that's a, a long debate of what uh, green industrial policies can look in, in, in countries like Brazil or in, in other emerging countries. But we cannot assume that simply by, print, by, by the central bank printing more money one way or another, it's enough. It's not enough. We have to go back to work on the part of the developmental state that we have lost after 30 years of neoliberalism, which is the ability of people working in the state to, conduct, to do a green industrial policy or to do industrial policy, to do a, a, a public investments. That is not there. Is not, I don't take it for granted. I know I'm from Romania and I, I keep talking to, to Romanian politicians about this. And they all tell me, but who's going to do this? We don't have the capacity. Even if we accept your crazy ideas, uh, who's going to do this? And we don't have enough, uh, uh, I would say, an enlightened uh, technocratic elite that is able to, to do what uh, the technocratic elites in the developmental state did, right? It's very important to remember that developmental states were successful not only because they have the good institutional arrangement uh, that was promotion, that had this role of promotional financing, but it also had a very capable technocratic elite that could maintain private, finance, private interests, in private industrial interests at, at arm's length and could impose some conditionality on them in, in return for state support. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, staying on this note on, um, yeah, the, the, the need to, to move to a, a promotional uh, relational regime, um, 
yeah, we have a question. Um, it's not it's not a top question, but it's yeah, it fits it fits in in, in, in this part of your narrative. <clears throat> it's by by Emma. I hope I pronounced your name uh, name right, Emma uh, Bergiser. Um, which international fora, if any, would be the place to make the case for moving to more promo uh, promotional monetary financing systems globally? Which are more less powerful in this area? And which are more or less open to pro progressive monetary policy? Uh, besides crash course, uh, I would say, uh, no, seriously, uh, UNCTAD is probably the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development is probably the most uh, open-minded and progressive international space for debating this kind of measures. And UNCTAD for a while now has been doing very important work on on sort of mapping why financial capitalism uh, can become can generate very destructive forces for emerging countries can become an impediment to green uh, new deal type of uh, institutional arrangements um, there aren't many although there are small openings here and there in the sense that central banks are thinking a lot about greening in the sense that we are now moving very clearly towards a, a normalization of, of debates on monetary financing and we just have to work through asking the right questions I mean, uh, as a heterodox economist, I would say that I'm, I'm very pleased to hear uh, central banks talking about monetary financing and talking about uh, yield curve targeting. But then when I ask myself, what is the politics of this? That's when the conceptual distinction between prudential and promotional comes in, because central banks still think, think of themselves as, as independent uh, technocrats who don't want to, do, to allocate resources. And that's not right. This is not how... Uh, this, we should think about this. And what about the, the, the national political arenas, uh, national parliaments, nation, uh, political parties? Uh, I mean, th these debates, I, I suppose, should also be part of, these, of the national debates, mm -hmm. uh, asking the commissions where they debate with ministers of finance, etc. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of UNCTAD. And, and of course, it, it, it publishes such nice reports and it is such a, a nice place for, for debate precisely because it, it doesn't have any real power because it was uh, sidelined uh, mm. in, in the 70s. Um, so isn't it perhaps better instead of a top-down approach to try to see if, if, the, if, this, if this is a topic that could potentially be politicized in the, in the national scale uh, where, where most of the politics uh, well, are debated? Yeah, and I'll add one more question, Daniela, because it's, it's very relevant and I think also addressed to, to the same kind of issues. It's by Giuliana Bolzani. Mm, I'm just Stone. reading it, yes. The, yeah, uh, you yeah, got to. I'll just read it because then people know what it is. So, thinking okay, in terms of political strategy and considering a rise in the number of populist government leaders, is now a good time to push for central banks financing governments? So, wouldn't it actually cause a populist rise, if I understand Juliana correctly? So, yeah, I think that's that's related to also Rodrigo's question. Mm. It would be great think, if yeah. you could deliver like a very optimistic answer because we're more or less finishing this session. So. <laughs> okay, you want me to finish on, on a populist? Oh, no, populist. On yeah, optimist note. Please do, please I can yeah. also finish on a populist note if you want. Uh, but I would say, um, I think uh, first to, to the question of um, do we not need national level political mobilization? And obviously that is the case. Uh, I mean, I've, got, I've been at UNCTAD and in UN spaces and it's very frustrating in, in terms of uh, the kind of political uh, negotiations and compromises that need to be done. And it's probably easier to, to start at the national level. And it's easier to, to start working both with uh, green or environmental movements. Uh, and there is a long battle to be fought there because I think market-based green finance is, is becoming very powerful as a discourse in, in the environmental movement. And that concerns me very seriously. Uh, but working with green parties, I guess, is our, uh, and, and with social democrats, wherever we have them and however we have them, is uh, the best that we, we, we can achieve in this, in this space, right? So uh, established political parties and, and activist movements, uh, environmental, uh, environmentalist activist movements. On Juliana's question, I have thought about this a lot because um, I've been... I mean, even the experience of countries like mine and countries close to mine in Hungary warn us towards the possibility that we are returning to an age that a progressive economist uh, or, a, or a macroeconomic arrangement that a progressive economist would applaud 
uh, but a populist conserv uh, or right-wing government uh, would sort of draw more political energy from. And, and that's a, a very serious question to, to grapple with. But I think at the same time, we have to recognize that a lot of the rise of populism, particularly to my mind uh, in, in Europe, uh, I would guess it's the, the case in uh, Latin American countries as well, has to do with the fact that the institutional arrangement that we have where you have an independent central bank that works, as Wolfgang Strick once said it, as an outpost of private finance in the government, that institutional arrangement has been very, very important in generating a, a political appeal for populism. So we, we have to take that historical uh, reality into account. That is something that I, I would call it a historical reality. I don't know how many people agree with me. Uh, and of course, there are some dangers in opening up central banks back to some form of uh, formal coordination with the government. But I want to think that in some ways, the political terrain there, uh, there is open for us to make a case that, that a, a, a closer relationship between the central bank and the government doesn't only st uh, function for a populist government or for financial capitalism in the historical juncture we are at now, but it can also function and it's absolutely necessary for a, a progressive uh, uh, environmental or green-led movement. I don't think we can get there otherwise. And these are the, the, some, the, the kind of risks that we need to take in some ways if we believe that the climate crisis is, is real and needs to be addressed now. We can't wait until all populist governments go uh, and then make the case for this. Yeah, yeah. Was this, was this optimistic enough? <laughs> well, for, well it, at least it, it, it gives me the spirit to, to continue the fight. So I think, I well, think that's At least perfect. you try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. It's it's about. I, I will I will say what Che Guevara used to say: be be realistic and dream the impossible. Well, <laughs> siamo realistas, soñamos lo imposible. Um, that's what all we can do now. I think uh, this wording as uh, the the final saying of uh, a series on monetary policy is quite an achievement. So thanks again, Daniela. Thank you so much for your super interesting talk. Uh, My pleasure. Just to say, Che Guevara was the head of the Central Bank of Cuba <laughs> at the beginning of the of the. Uh, the uh, Cuban Revolution. So I am finishing with the words of a famous central banker. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure one of his nephews now is probably also the, the head of the central bank. So I'll, I'll check it out for you later. So thank you again, Daniela. Uh, and thank you very much also uh, to all uh, attendees for participating in this webinar of Crash Course, which was the, the last one, the last session in our series on monetary policy. We're, of course, very sorry. Uh, that we couldn't answer uh, all your questions, but we I hope at least that we, we managed to answer some of them. And um, well, maybe there'll be another occasion with Daniela to, to go into depth uh, regarding these important issues. So um, also important to know for you is that there will be a recording of this webinar published on our website, and there'll also be a podcast version and a short transcript. Um, we'll be on summer break for a while. Uh, and then we will reflect on the future of Crash Course and which topics we'd like to discuss with you. But one of the options on the table right now is uh, future scenarios regarding the role of corporations in our society in the context of climate change. Uh, that's also a topic that you touched upon today, uh, Daniela. So we, we know more or less what we should ask from central banks, I think, after this series when it comes to financing uh, the green transition, but what exactly should we ask corporations or eh, what, what, what are the positions um, for a green transition when it comes to the role of corporations in our society? So I think that will be an interesting question for one of the next series, perhaps. So um, I will just quickly show you uh, our website, um, which is right here this is our lovely website designed by jeremy so here we'll put uh, a recording of the session uh, and if you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter you can do so here by clicking on sign up for our newsletter um, so please do so and we'll keep you informed about uh, crash course and the future uh, after the summer but if you have good ideas you can also always email us and um, yeah for now i'd like to say Thank you very much for participating. I wish you a lovely summer. I hope you have a lot of food for thought uh, stemming from, uh, from these uh, webinars. And we hope to see you after the summer break. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, guys and uh, girls. See <laughs> you. Guys. Bye.